Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. I'm Claire, a librarian at the Greece Public Library, and I coordinate As the Page Turns Book Club and also purchase our adult nonfiction. And today, my guest is Rebecca, a fellow librarian here at the library. Welcome, Rebecca. Hi. So um, I do the Pints and Prose Book Club, and we meet the second Wednesday of each month. Uh, we've been meeting at Host 22 in Charlotte. We'll be doing that for the winter, and then in the summer, we usually move over to uh, Blue Barn Cidery for a few months. The next uh, book that we're doing is uh, The Personal Librarian by Marie Benedict, and then after that, we are doing Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. Oh, I love that book. I haven't read, I haven't read that one yet. Oh, so. okay. Marcellus is like one of my favorite literary characters. I'm so. looking forward to it. All right. So, Rebecca, do you like set goals for yourself for reading in the year? No, I don't. Okay. I'm just very random. I just like sort of like to hunt and peck and nibble. So you don't do like challenges, no. keep any logs, good reads, anything like that? I guess I'm not very organized. No, well, <laughs> no, I think it's all, I usually, I, I am really organized. You'd uh-huh. be shocked looking at my office as you do. But uh, yeah, when I, I always keep track of everything I read, everything I want to read. Uh-huh. It's really funny. So yeah, this year I, I have intentions too, like more backlist and own books mm-hmm. less thrillers and more nonfiction, and also have an audiobook going all the time so that's what i'm going to try to do we'll wow, see if i'm lot. successful what was your most unexpected genre breakout for 23 i think fantasy yeah. especially like that cozy fantasy i really like that and i'm actually reading a little bit of romance which is shocking as cynical mm-hmm. as i am but yeah yeah i can blame gemini for for that, ever since that one fantasy episode, I've I've actually really enjoyed it. I can it. recall it very well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, I am going to start. My first book actually is a thriller that mm-hmm. I am reading for our first as the page turns this month, and it was called All the Dangerous Things by Stacy Willingham, and. It's funny because I think Stephanie, when she was on here, this was like one of her most anticipated books from last year. Mm -hmm. So um, the setup is there's a distressed mother, Isabel Drake, and her son was literally kidnapped from his crib or bed right in their house while she and her husband were sleeping. And since this happened, it's been about a year, she has not really slept. Um she is desperate for clues. She's starting to become kind of unhinged, I guess you would say. Um, Her husband and she have broken up, as many people in this kind of tragic situation. A lot of times the marriage just doesn't survive. So she begins appearing on, like they're there are conventions for true crime people. So she is a speaker there, and then she gets approached by a man who does a podcast. So she decides that she's just going for it. She's tired of what people think. She wants some resolution into what happened for her son because, of course, she doesn't believe he's dead. She thinks he's out there somewhere. But, um, but of course, you know, in all of these things, she's an unreliable narrator. She has secrets in her own life. Her husband also has secrets. You know, his right. first wife may have committed suicide, you know, um, so it was it was interesting and it was very twisty and turny if if you like that kind of thing. What I didn't like, I am so over that unreliable narrator right. trope. Yeah. I, I am just I'm over it. So and, trendy. Um, yes, it is. And it's it's been going on now for a while. I think the woman in the train, gone girl, you know, they started right. it. But um it it was fun and twisty and it was a very fast read. But um for me personally, I I have trouble with that suspension of disbelief, mm-hmm. and it cracks me up that things can happen in these books that mm-hmm. a normal police person would, oh, well, let's check for DNA, or let's do this, but that never happens in these stories, you know? Right. So um, I would say if you like, like Sally Hepworth or Lisa Jewell, like, or the classic, you know, Woman on the Train, Paula Hawkins, this would be a great book for you. For me, it was a little bit of a miss, but I'm going to be really interested to see what my book group says about it. Uh Um, The one interesting, I think, 
I found is there was kind of a sideline and like how we're all fascinated with true crime. And I, f- I fall into this too. Sure. Like, like we talk about, Sean, you listen to podcasts sometimes, or, you know, we watch shows on Netflix about it. But mm-hmm. um, America in general is pretty fascinated with true crime. So that's kind of a theme in here as to how she gets the word out. But um, yeah, that was my first one. All the Dangerous Things by Stacey Willingham. To kind of illustrate your point there, there are approximately 330 million people that live in America, right? Uh-huh. So that means a, something that happens one in a million happens 330 times a day. Now I'm just going to sit here and think about that. <laughs> If it involves people like that, you know? Right, yeah. First time I heard that, I was like, I don't... What am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. <laughs> for one thing. Secondly, I have to go to the desk. I mean, I have to sit there and sit with that. So, right. There you go. That's that's my disruption for the day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's your first one for us, Rebecca? So I decided to pick out some nonfiction books because I'm actually a nonfiction fan. That's my preferred genre. So uh, the first one that I wanted to talk about is called Shakespeare Was a Woman and Other Heresies, How Doubting the Bard Became the Biggest Taboo in Literature by Elizabeth Winkler. And this book was from 2023. So Shakespeare's authorship of works attributed to him has been questioned um, by many throughout the years, including Walt Whitman, uh, Mark Twain, Charlie Mm -hmm. Chaplin. Uh, It could be a pseudonym for somebody who wants to conceal their identity for some reason because they're a woman, because they're a nobleman. It could be like for a group of people actually hiding behind that name. So the argument... um, Um, against the idea that he was the author is that the plays were written by somebody who is deeply educated, thoroughly grounded in the classics of uh, Greek and Latin literature, widely traveled, and a master of geography, history, and courtly behavior. So how could they possibly have been written by a small-town grain merchant? Mm -hmm. But for every argument, there is a counter-argument. For example, somebody would say, well, he he wrote uh, plays that are set in distant times and places, so he obviously has knowledge of that, right? And then somebody else would say, but, there's always a yes, but, but he got it wrong. There are anachronisms like um, people might be talking about... um, they're set in a, a distant time period, but then they're talking about uh, people that haven't even been born yet. Mm-hmm. So, um, so Winkler's book is about not only the controversy and its history, but how upset people uh, got about it and how outraged they got about it. She published an article in The Atlantic, mm-hmm. and the backlash was fierce with academics writing in and accusing her of being like an anti-vaxxer or a Holocaust <laughs> denier <laughs> just for questioning Shakespeare's authorship whoa so that's a big reach yeah so she actually goes and she talks to these people like a journalist and they have uh, civil discussions but nobody's mind is really changed but it's just a very interesting book it sort of tells you um the whole history of this controversy and I don't usually like books where the author inserts himself into it, like nonfiction story. They do that a lot in the true crime genre. Mm-hmm. It's like I, I drove to my hotel and I parked my car and I ordered a pizza and they yeah. like tell you everything they did. It's like, I don't care. Yeah. But in this case, it really makes it um, is an exception and it really makes it very interesting, which brings me to the second book, which is called uh, Stalking Shakespeare, A Memoir of Madness, Murder, and My Search for the Poet Beneath the Paint by Lee Durkee. And this was one of your favorite books of last year because I remember you picked it for staff picks. I did. It was one of my favorites. So the author of this book has um, ADHD, he has OCD, he's grappling with a divorce, and he's basically struggling in poverty, isolation, and depression. And he goes down this rabbit hole of becoming obsessed with finding the real Shakespeare in the visual depictions of him. Okay. So that kind of becomes a way to sort of look at who was Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. You know, the authorship of Shakespeare's uh, works. And some of the titles for the chapters here are Gigolo Shakespeare, Brawler Shakespeare, (laughs) Samurai Shakespeare, Marvelous Heinous Shakespeare. Oh, that sounds fun. It is. It's actually very fun. So they kind of... um, 
the two books kind of uh, go together, I think, and they're both really interesting. I think they would be interesting to somebody who like has a lot of knowledge of the topic, but just somebody who is, you know, just a general reader and is maybe a little bit curious, uh, but they're thinking, well, do I really have the background? Do I need to know like a bunch of history to understand this? Is it going to be really academic? It isn't. It's very accessible and very fun and breezy writing. And the fact that they brought their own story into it really kind of draws you into the draws you into it and engages you. I might have to add one of those. That that really does sound kind of interesting. Yeah. And you know, for the first book, I have heard people I mean, there are definitely have been theories afloat that Shakespeare was not who he said he was. Oh yes. Yeah. So interesting. All right, well I'm gonna go in a totally different direction. Okay. Back to fiction. And my coworker had a book on her best of last last year. It was called Divine Rivals. Well, I read that one and I really liked it. Uh-huh. And uh, it was kind of a surprise for me because it's it's classified as a teen novel. Um, a quick summary: It was like two young rival journalists that find love through a magical connection, but it's set in like um. A, a wartime. It kind of gave me World War One vibes, but it was between gods and goddesses, and they were able to communicate through these typewriters that had a magical connection. Hmm. So it's kind of an enemies to lovers thing. That was Divine Rivals. Well, I liked it so much, I read the second one, which mm-hmm. just came out at the end of December, and that one is called Ruthless Vows. So Ruthless Vows kind of picks up where the first one left off, where I'm not going to say why, but, you know, this war is continuing. The lovers have been separated. The um, man, his name is Roman, he's been injured. And he's been healed by a god, but when he was healed by the god, he lost his memory. So here you have um, Iris and Roman, and they are, again, separated. Um, She remembers everything, but he does not. And he's also forced into service because they're both writers as portraying newspaper articles and everything for this one God's point of view, which is the opposite side of where they would have been. Um, So it was interesting because they still, she finds a way to get another typewriter, like a magical typewriter, and starts the correspondence again. And gradually he starts to remember things. But... um, it was really, if, if you like like a Greek mythology retelling, uh-huh. which I love a gr- good Greek mythology, sure. it kind of had those vibes too. Um, and it, the thing I liked about it is a lot of teen books have this kind of set pattern. You have a couple, they fall in love, but then there's a, a friend or something, so it's almost like a love triangle. There was none of that. Uh-huh. You had the war story, you had their romance, you had them get separated and then had to figure out like, are they both going to live? Are they going to get back together? Like, will there be some rel- resolution? And how will this war end? So it really was interesting. I would not say it is um, a typical teen book. And I I really liked it and would recommend it to adults as well. Um, this author also has series in adults. So maybe that's why, you know. Um, Who's the author? Rebecca Ross. Oh. Okay. So the other one uh, she wrote, and I read the first one in that one too, is called A River Enchanted, and I really liked it. So I would say if you like like mythology retellings, Shadow and Bone maybe by Leah Bardugo, that one was on TV and kind of had some adult crossover, this would be a good pick for you. But um, yeah, so this one was the second one in the series. It's called Ruthless Vows by Rebecca Ross. A lot of adults are getting into young adult fiction now. Yeah. Yeah. There is a lot of crossover. So, continuing on with my nonfiction choices, this one is called Monsters on the Couch, The Real Psychological Disorders Behind Your Favorite Horror Movies by Brian A. Sharpless. So, I'm not only a, a true crime fan, I'm actually a horror aficionado as well from the old days when I was a... Uh, 
little girl growing up in Brockport, they used to put on horror movies on Saturday afternoons, and mm-hmm. I, would, I would watch them, you know, these old, like, black and white movies. Which well, like, only, like The Tingler and some stuff of these. Stuff like that. <laughs> and only now I'm realizing some of these were actually pretty inappropriate for right. children. They were pretty intense. But anyway, we were free-range kids, so, you yeah. know, we watched them. So... Instead of monsters under the bed, they are monsters on the couch. And the author is actually, he is a practicing clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. He does therapy, so he kind of has a background of both being a horror fan and also um, being a psychologist. So he talks about different movie monsters that we know, such as a vampire, the werewolf, the the zombie, etc. And asks two different questions, uh, which are, why do some people believe in these monsters and why do some people believe they are these monsters okay because some people actually believe that too so he delves into some of the folklore and the theory about beliefs in the monsters like the the werewolves and and the vampires you know like why do people believe in that you know um did they see a a rabid wolf you know did they see somebody that was a victim of a a serial killer and they thought a, a wolf had gotten them so that's you know some of the background theories Some of the syndromes, actual clinical syndromes that he talks about include Renfield's syndrome, which is a compulsion to drink human blood. Oh. (laughs) Cotard's syndrome, which is the belief that you are already dead. Oh, so like zombie syndrome. Yeah, it's sort of like a zombie syndrome. And Capgrass syndrome, which is the belief that people around you have been replaced by imposters. Oh. As in Invasion of the Body Snatchers Mm -hmm. and The Stepford Wives. Mm -hmm. But in both of those movies, it wasn't a delusion. It was real. Um, And things like Nightmare on Elm Street, like sleep paralysis is a real thing. Like people will be like half asleep, half awake, and they, they think that something is really happening. It's like a delusion. And so he even says that he has used horror movies in his therapy, like to desensitize people if they have, maybe they have a fear of blood, they have a phobia, like show them a, a movie that is, has, is bloody. Mm-hmm. Which seems contrary to common sense, like maybe that would scare them even more, but apparently it like desensitizes them. But um, it is a very interesting book because he is a fan, and that really comes through, and it gives you a little bit of a different perspective. And he goes, he goes, uh, talks about like a lot of different ones. Like I only touched on a few of them. A lot of different horror movie themes. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Does he talk about maybe how some of the directors, if any of them, struggled with any of the, these disorders or syndromes themselves, or not so much? He doesn't actually talk about yeah. them, but that's a pretty interesting question. Right. All right. So my next one was kind of a, a, a quirky read, and it was called What You Are Looking For is in the Library by Michiko Ayawama, and it's translated by Allison Watts. So uh-huh. this book was originally published in Japanese. Um, I love books about books, so when I saw this one and saw the cover, it's kind of got like a bookshelf and like a little cat sitting there. I don't know. It just looked really, really sweet and charming to me. And the story is told through some interconnected short stories almost. So they each, like each section is about a certain character, but all of them involve a visit to this one community library where they meet up with this memorable reference librarian. Her name is Sayori Kamachi. She's a very large woman. The way they describe this woman is pretty funny. She has, like, really pale skin. She has her hair in a top knot, and she wears, like, this little thing with flowers on it that's stuck in her bun. And her first question is always, what are you looking for? And, of course, these people are not just looking for books. Each one of them kind of has, like, a crisis point in their lives. Like, the first one is a young woman. She's 21. She works at, like, a woman's wear sales associate shop. But she's looking for meaning in her life and, like, something else. Um, The next one is a guy. He's 35. He's a middle manager in a furniture company, but he really has a dream of opening his own antique shop. (laughs) So, you know, he's trying to grapple with that. Like, what's he going to do with his life? He's 35 years old. There's a a woman who's 40, who's a former magazine editor. She was actually demoted because she had her 
a daughter. She had one child. So now she's struggling with, you know, motherhood and dividing work between her working spouse and herself and the fact that they put her in a job that's more convenient for her, but also she's not fulfilled anymore because she was a magazine editor. Um, and then there's a young man who's 30, and he calls himself a neat, which is not at employment, not educated or trained. <laughs> so, And he's just trying to figure out, like, what am I supposed to do with my life? He wanted to be an artist and then just couldn't hold down a job, you know, was really, really struggling. Um, but all of these people end up interacting with librarian, and she gives them, one, this little, like, felted gift mm -hmm. that she's always, like, felting. So it's like a little object, like one is a frying pan, one is a, a, an airplane. But it, it has, it'll eventually have some significance for mm -hmm. this person in their search. And she gives them, like, some books about whatever topic that they have asked her about, but also something that seems totally unrelated that ends up being the most important book that they checked out. Um, so it was, it was fun. It was cool. Rita likes, some people said, The Midnight Library, uh -huh. or there's another Japanese book called Before the Coffee Gets Cold. Um, I haven't read that one yet, but I'm, I'm kind of tempted after this one. But... Um, yeah, it was it was really quirky. It was cute. I liked it, you know. It's sort of magical realism. Yeah, magical realism and just kind of uplifting, you uh -huh. know. And and also, not everybody has their stuff together, but they all come to realize that they're moving forward with their lives, uh -huh. and that's good enough, you know. So, yeah. So I like that all three of the books that you mentioned are, are ones that I had never heard of. Oh, good. Yeah, so they're not, they're not like mainstream at all. Awesome. So the last book that I, I was going to talk about is called The Lost Tomb and Other Real-Life Stories of Bones, Burial, and Murder by Douglas Preston. Okay. Uh, Preston and Child, they write thrillers together. But this is a nonfiction book, and it has 13 different stories in it of um, various mysterious events, unsolved murders, unexplained discoveries, buried treasure, etc., such as Oak Island, you know, the mystery of Oak Island, where they keep trying to find this buried treasure, the monster of Florence. And one of the ones that they talk about is the Dyatlov Pass incident, which I think maybe people have heard of, or maybe some people haven't. But it w happened in um, 1959, and there was a group of uh, cross-country skiers in mm -hmm. Russia. They were going through the Ural Mountains, and they disappeared. And it wasn't until a couple months later they finally discovered all of the bodies, and they were, like, in very mysterious condition. They, they looked like they had been hit by a car or something. They had, like, burns. They had parts of their body missing. Some of them were nude. Some of them were, like, wearing shredded clothing. Oh, wow. And so they were try had all kinds of theories about what could have happened. Like, was it, a, um, like, a serial killer? Was it a yeti? Was it, like, the, um, the Russian army saw them? Like, they stumbled onto some kind of secret maneuver they weren't supposed to know about um, was it something natural like an avalanche mm -hmm. so like there have been like so many um ideas floated to explain what happens but anyway he does uh present a really uh compelling explanation so i'm just not going to spoil it by letting anybody know but that was what i thought was the most interesting story in the book okay so that's cool. That sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I remember purchasing that one, and I was like, uh -huh. wow, I, I know he writes fiction, but I know he, I didn't realize he delved into nonfiction as yeah. well. So, well, we've got some really good and interesting choices for you, so thank you for joining us for another edition of Book Break, and thank you to Rebecca for being my, my special guest. We're going to really change it. In February, we'll talk some romance, but then, you know, we'll probably have another reading roundup. But let us know if any of these books appeal to you and what you have been reading so far in 2024. And thanks for joining us for another edition of Book Break. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the friends of the Greece Public Library. The music composed and performed by the